Joseph Stalin, paranoid dictator and the formidable architect of the Soviet Union's triumph over Nazi Germany in World War II, met a brutal yet mysterious end on the 5th of March, 1953. Enveloped in a cloak of enigma and irony, his death unfolded amidst the shadows of his power-hungry successors, eager to claim the vast empire he left behind. During his funeral, Moscow was the scene of a grand yet somber spectacle. Joseph Stalin's body lay in state, enveloped in a bed of flowers, drawing an immense crowd of onlookers, officials and the press, the vast majority displaying calculated expressions of mourning. The atmosphere was heavy, with a mix of genuine mourning, but also of fear and obedience. Stalin, who had led the Soviet Union through years of war, famine, imprisonments and purges, lay there with a carefully crafted stoic appearance. Easily recognisable by his thick moustache and swept back hair, Stalin left behind a complex legacy of profound contradictions. As a leader, he had been both feared and revered. Millions suffered in the harsh conditions of Siberia's gulags, and his inner circle was constantly under threat due to his notorious paranoia. But at the same time, he had led the Soviet Union through the Second World War, with many seeing him as the architect of the Soviet Union's newfound prominence on the world stage. Thus, his death marked the end of an era and the beginning of a complex period of transition and power struggles within the Soviet Union. The enigmatic circumstances of his passing, coupled with the inherent secrecy of the Soviet regime, have fueled a broad spectrum of theories about the exact causes and circumstances of his demise. Some argue that Stalin's intense paranoia ultimately led to his catastrophic end, while others, including Stalin's own son, suspected that he fell victim to poisoning. Join us today as we unravel the mystery of Joseph Stalin's brutal death. According to Nikita Khrushchev, one of Stalin's potential successors, key members of the Soviet leadership were present at Stalin's home on the night before he was found critically ill. This group allegedly included Lavrenti Beria, head of the secret police, Georgi Malenkov, Stalin's deputy premier, Nikolai Bulganin, the defense minister, and Khrushchev himself. All of these men were power-hungry schemers, intent on taking over from Stalin after his eventual passing. It's important to note that this account primarily comes from Khrushchev's recollections, which might be influenced by his personal perspectives and the political context of the time. However, if true, it certainly would not have been an unusual event. In the years leading up to his death, Stalin often invited members of his inner circle to his home for social gatherings, which included watching movies and drinking. These events, which became more frequent towards the end of his life, likely served multiple purposes. They were not only social occasions, but also opportunities for Stalin to monitor and control his closest associates, reflecting his deep-seated paranoia. The evening of March 1st, 1953, apparently commenced with dinner and heavy drinking, and according to Khrushchev's later recollections, the guests departed in the early hours of the morning, with Stalin appearing to be in a good mood. Stalin retired to his room with strict instructions to his staff not to disturb him until he made some noise to indicate he was awake. This was a routine Stalin had established, typically signalling his guards by 10 a.m. However, on this particular day, hours passed without any sound from his room. The historical accounts suggest that due to a deep-seated fear of agitating the notoriously temperamental Stalin and the potential for severe consequences, his staff hesitated to check on him. It wasn't until late in the evening that either a maid or a guard found Stalin lying on the floor of his room, barely alive. Stalin appeared to have suffered a stroke. He was found unresponsive, barely breathing and incontinent. His staff, cautious and fearful of the repercussions of their decisions, carried him to a sofa in his dining room. There was significant trepidation about calling a doctor, and instead, the Minister of State Security was contacted, who in turn alerted Lavrenti Beria, the chief of the secret police. The accounts of what happened next vary, but there is a general belief that Beria and others delayed taking further action. 
This hesitation might have been due to concerns about the potential consequences if Stalin survived, or, as some have speculated, because they preferred Stalin to be incapacitated or dead. Doctors were eventually summoned to attend to Joseph Stalin in the morning hours, between 7 and 10 a.m. the following day. Upon arrival, they found Stalin in a grave state, struggling with breathing difficulties, partial paralysis, and exhibiting symptoms such as vomiting blood. The doctors who did attend to Stalin were not his usual medical team and were initially uncertain about the appropriate course of treatment. Their hesitation and uncertainty were likely exacerbated by the fear of repercussions. Accounts from the time suggest that the attending physicians were visibly nervous, to the extent that their anxiety impeded their ability to conduct a thorough examination. Over the subsequent days, Stalin's condition worsened, and he experienced intense suffering. Despite the medical attention, he did not recover and ultimately passed away on March 5, 1953. His daughter, Svetlana Aliluyeva, was present during his final moments. She later described the scene in stark terms, recounting the severe agony her father endured, saying, The agony was terrible. He literally choked to death as we watched. Due to the delays in treating the dying dictator, there is considerable speculation that Stalin's potential successors seized the opportunity presented by Stalin's stroke to eliminate the paranoid dictator. Or perhaps his death may have even been caused by poisoning during the night of drinking the night before. Each of Joseph Stalin's close associates present on that evening had their own complex motivations and personal histories with the Soviet leader. Vyacheslav Molotov, a prominent member of Stalin's inner circle, had a particularly personal grievance. Five years before Stalin's death, Molotov's Jewish wife, Polina, was arrested for alleged treason, accused of having ties with Zionist organizations. She was subsequently imprisoned and exiled. Molotov, unable to communicate with her due to Stalin's interference, is said to have had two meals served each evening as a poignant reminder of her absence, later expressing sorrow and guilt over her suffering. Lavrenti Beria, Georgi Malenkov, and Nikita Khrushchev, although not driven by such intimate grievances as Molotov, were deeply aware of Stalin's failing health and the power vacuum his demise would create. Each harbored ambitions of succeeding Stalin and recognized the danger they faced from Stalin's notorious and unpredictable paranoia. Their positions of influence within the Soviet hierarchy were perpetually at risk as long as Stalin was alive providing a potential motive for wanting to hasten his end. Beria, in particular, is often thought to have had the most to gain from Stalin's death. Rumors suggest he had fallen out of favor with Stalin, possibly fueling resentment and a desire for revenge. In private, Beria reportedly showed no attempt to conceal his satisfaction with the turn of events, and, according to Molotov's memoirs, Beria even boasted to the Politburo that he had done Stalin in and saved us all. The conjecture that Stalin was murdered, possibly by Beria or his associates, remains a topic of debate and speculation. An autopsy was performed on Stalin's body, revealing a large hemorrhage in the left cerebral hemisphere and other significant health issues, including hypertrophy of the left ventricle and atherosclerotic changes in the cerebral arteries. These findings were consistent with extracranial changes often seen in stroke victims, countering the theories of deliberate poisoning that have been speculated over the years. Nevertheless, it must be noted that this autopsy was done in the Soviet Union, hardly a bastion of free speech or transparency. Thus, while there is no concrete physical evidence to conclusively prove the poisoning theory, it is not outside the realm of historical speculation. However, what is clear is that Stalin's oppressive regime and his brutal treatment of those around him, including his own inner circle, fostered an atmosphere of fear and treachery that ultimately contributed to his downfall. In an incident illustrating Stalin's growing mistrust and suspicion, he had a doctor arrested and imprisoned on charges of being a spy for British intelligence nearly a year before his death. This was after the doctor had advised Stalin to retire to reduce the stress affecting his health. This incident catalyzed the further arrest of numerous other doctors on fabricated charges of conspiring to assassinate Soviet leaders. 
these accusations were based on coerced confessions, often extracted under extreme duress, reflecting Stalin's deep-seated paranoia and the use of terror as a means of control. This terror amongst his doctors is widely believed to have contributed to the large delays in providing Stalin with adequate treatment in his final moments. The doctors were unsure what to do, largely because his most experienced doctors had been imprisoned at his own request, and possibly because the doctors feared the repercussions if he had survived. Thus, in a twist of irony, Stalin's death was in part caused by his own paranoid machinations. Following the death of Joseph Stalin, the Soviet Union underwent a period of significant transformation. One of the most immediate and impactful changes was the release of millions of individuals from the gulags, which effectively halved the prison population of the nation. This act marked a departure from the oppressive policies that had characterized Stalin's rule. Additionally, the practice of torture, which had been a notorious aspect of the Soviet regime's enforcement tactics, was officially banned across Russia. Another significant reversal was the release of the doctors who had been unjustly imprisoned as part of the so-called doctor's plot. The period that followed led to various social and political reforms, not only within the Soviet Union, but also in its satellite states. This shift, however, was not without its challenges and upheavals. One of the most notable events in this era was the Hungarian Uprising of 1956, a revolution that was in part a response to the policies of de-Stalinization and the broader context of reform and unrest within the Eastern Bloc. To understand more about how de-Stalinization influenced the events leading up to the Hungarian Uprising and its significance in the context of the Cold War, click on the end screen now to delve into this pivotal moment in history.